It's time for Security Now, a really big shoe for you. We're going to talk about a new vulnerability in almost every router, on almost every computer, on almost every television set and toaster and microwave oven that allows bad guys to work their way with your network. The problem with UPnP coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for Security Now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 389, recorded January 30th, 2013. Unplug UPnP. Security Now is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash security now. It's time for Security Now, the show that covers you and your loved ones in... In a, an invisible shield, a barrier against the malware, the viruses, the privacy invasions the Internet is prone to. And we all owe a big gratitude of thanks, a heaping gratitude of thanks to Mr. Steve Gibson. Uh, a heaping helping. <laughs> a turducken stuffed with three kinds of gratefulness to Steve Gibson. He is the explainer-in-chief and our security guru. Hello, Steve. Hey, Leo, where we're here for episode 389, which is a Q&A, our 160th Q&A. Wow. And uh, we have big news this week, um, really interesting news. It's It's been funny because there's been a Twitter storm of people saying, oh, my God, do you know about this? This was something that just came out yesterday. Um, our old friend H.D. Moore, who, you know, is the famous... Uh, original author and curator of the Metasploit framework, which we've spoken of many times in the last eight years, and an HD, you know, pops up on the radar from time to time. He finished uh, about a month ago a a five and a half month scan of the entire internet for exploitable, universal, plug-and-play router ports. Oh, dear. And he found 81 million. <laughs> That's not individual routers, though, right? <laughs> yes, 81 individual routers. 81 million individual exploitable routers. 2.2% of the entire public IP v4 address space has... Open, exploitable, universal plug-and-play routers on them right now. It's a disaster. Um, so, and when you anyway, say exploitable, is it theoretically exploitable, or there are known exploits that can take advantage of these routers? Known exploits. Oh, crap. We're going to go into it in detail at the top of the show. Um, and and I'm, I have no choice but to quickly add scanning for that to Shields Up. So that'll be the first oh, change I make to Shields Up in year. I mean, that's, that's what Shields Up is for, that's is fantastic. to allow people to check themselves. Yeah. So I'm going to do that. Um, but, I'm surprised uh, it's so low if you say it's only 2%. I would, one of, would have thought that virtually all routers, because isn't UPnP on by default on routers? No, but this is it. It should never be on the public side. It ah. should never be exposed to the Internet. Oh, you're it's saying that you could, from the outside, use UPnP? No, any hacker, Leo, can take over people's private networks. Oh. 81 million that of them. That doesn't sound good. No, <laughs> this is really bad. That, that doesn't sound good, you know. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, this, we've talked about this. We've known about this. But what was funny was I saw some there's some dialogues happening in, in Twitter where people kept the at SGGRC in their dialogue and they were saying, Yeah, we you know, Gibson told us about this two years ago. It's like, well, yeah. 
And, you know, and I wrote, of course, Unplug and Pray right. famously 11 years ago wow. when, Mic when Microsoft first screwed up with, you know, their initial UPnP server. So anyway, you want to talk to our listeners first, but then we'll get into all this. And we've got lots of interesting. I did 11 uh, questions today because a couple are just kind of fluffy. It's like, oh, well, they're fun. So. <laughs> What you really want to give value for dollars. Ah, uh, we're going to keep every, we're going to give 90 minutes no matter what. <laughs> not, not time, value. Just value. Oh, and by the no way, it looks like people, questions. It looks like our listeners all just went to Shields Up, but don't go there yet. I oh, have not Steve. That. I have not, I have not written have that you yet. Not, have you not learned? I didn't know. Have you not learned? We brought down before the show. Are you going to yeah. mention this uh, underwater cable site on the show? or? I think we should because, we you know, people. We just brought it will, down. We might as well. Continue to keep it down. Absolutely. You, you tell them. <laughs> Before we do that, let's talk a little bit about our friends at audible.com, a great place to go. Uh, well, I'm going on a midnight flight, for instance, and uh, that means to I'll Georgia? have a... Pardon me? No, not to Georgia. To midnight flight to Georgia. Well, I'm <laughs> actually, as a matter of fact, I am. Oh. I'm going to Atlanta, and then I'm, get, I'm then changing planes for New Orleans. So you're well, right. I am on a midnight flight flight to georgia on uh this at midnight tonight that but would be when yes tonight thank would be you midnight. for doing the podcast first leo because <laughs> at, at the rate we're going this is going to be a high value production <laughs> um so i will be loading up what i do actually it's i it's uh i use the audible app on either the iphone or the android phone and i will be taking both and so all i have to do really is buy books and so what i do is i go to audible.com and i go through it and i happen to have two credits for books so i'm going to pick a couple of books and then i refresh my audible app and i have access through the audible app to all of the books i've ever bought and i've been an audible member since 2000 february 2000 so that means there's well over 500 books in my library. And I could just then, before I leave, I usually do this on Wi-Fi, although you don't have to. I download the books that I'm going to listen to. And I'll tell you, a, a, no long plane flight, train flight, commute, a day at the gym, a, a day scrubbing the clothes, nothing f phases me anymore because I've got great books to listen to at all times. Not just uh, not just modern books either. Look, here's Pride and Prejudice. You could go back through the classics. They have virtually all the classics beautifully recorded for Audible. Sci-fi. I know you you all are sci-fi fans. Audible has, th and really we have to thank Audible for this. They have a program called Audible Frontiers where they have recorded many of the classic sci-fi novels, sometimes for the first time ever. Here's Jerry Purnell and Larry Niven's The Gripping Hand. I have not listened to this yet. Ooh, that's the sequel to... Um, Moten God's Eye. A Moten God's Eye, Which yes. I did listen to and I love. This just came out in November. So add it to the cart. I'm definitely picking this one up. Um, now, let me tell you how you can get Audible for your very own some... Uh, in fact, I can get you your first book free if you go to audiblepodcast.com. Slash slash security now audiblepodcast.com slash security now you'll be signing up for the gold account that's the book a month account I think book a month is a very good way to start the first month's free your first book is free cancel at any time pay nothing and the book is yours to keep forever so choose carefully pick a great book listen to it they have the best narrators they have the best books over a hundred thousand titles. I'm just a huge fan. Audiblepodcast.com slash security now. And yes, if you're a Steve Gibson fan, you know he loves Peter F. Hamilton. The newest Peter F. Hamilton is on here. I do already have that. That's what I'm going to be listening to on the way to uh, uh, New Orleans. Ooh, neat. You can you can tell us what you yeah. think because I I haven't started yet. Yeah, it's a little it's a little different. It's called Great North Road. It's a, a murder mystery and it takes place in like the year 2300 or something. 36 hours. I don't know if I'll finish it by the time I get back. It's not that long a flight. Sometimes you <laughs> drive around the block because you haven't finished the book. <laughs> I'm not, you're not ready to be. I'm not, not ready, ready to get, to get out yet. of the car. <laughs> Audiblepodcast.com slash security now. Get your book free. All right, Steve Arino. Fire okay. when ready. So we have, Lord knows, um, this is not any news to our listeners. Uh, how many times have we talked about the fundamental problems with the design 
of the universal plug and play protocol, the whole concept. And, and this is it. I mean, it, it arose from the typical tension which exists between ease of use and security. Standard, one of our fundamental lemmas of, of, of security is that there's, there is going to be a, a, a competing interests, I guess, between something that's easy to, do, you, easy to use and also secure. So, for example, if in a state-of-the-art home environment – You've got everything on your network. And my God, anything you buy now comes with Wi-Fi built in. You know, the televisions, the the toaster ovens, you name it, it's got Wi-Fi for some reason. And in order for these things to self-configure, they, of course, they have DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, which allows them to ask for an IP from your router. But... They also universally now have uh, universal plug and play, which is a it's a it's a a system that allows those devices to be discovered, which is the actual terminology used discovery on the net. It's possible for, for example, Windows or a Mac or a Linux machine to send out a discovery packet onto the net. Actually, on a local network, you can use a broadcast packet, which we have talked about in the past, where it's essentially addressed to everybody. And the, the so the query is, who has UPnP? And those devices that have universal plug and play will respond to that query. And, and then the computer starts to talk to them one at a time, asking them about their capabilities, what sort of interfaces do they have, and so forth. So, so, so the problem with that is that if something, oh, that well, the, well, there are, there are several problems. First of all, computers respond too. So, if malware got into one computer, it could send out a query for all the other computers which are currently on, and use the universal plug and play to put holes in their firewalls and access them directly. So because that's one of the main capabilities of universal plug and play is router configuration. The for example, BitTorrent is a is a un, is a well-known deliberate universal plug and play client. So when you run BitTorrent on a machine in your network, it it tracks down your router through UPnP, and it says, "Hi there, uh, what is your external IP address?" Because that's not something which is known inside the network. Inside the network, you only have private IP addresses. But BitTorrent needs to know your current public external IP address so that it can tell other bit torrents out on the internet how to contact you so it asks the router what's your public ip thank you very much now please give me an open port and so the router configuration is changed through this universal plug and play dialogue to allow BitTorrent to receive unsolicited incoming track traffic to the ip that the router has just disclosed to it and routed to the machine running BitTorrent so that it's able to knit itself into the big BitTorrent network in the cloud. So there, there there's a, a typical example of the way this should work. N at no point in time has it ever been suggested that any of this should be functioning on the public interface, that is on the outside facing surface of the router all of this is own universal plug and play only makes sense it's only designed for inside your home inside your office you know inside your your lan your local area network never on the wan on the wide area network on the internet it turns out that through just not caring i mean the only way to explain this is that no one cared a 
huge number of routers do have universal plug and play exposed. That is this same interface that I was just describing, very powerful on their public side, on the public facing interface, such that if a hacker knew the router's IP address, that hacker could send universal plug and play queries to the router with the same level of control and power as happens inside because there's no password there's no security there's there's no log on the whole I mean, here again i mean the, it would be nice if there were but if there were then you then universal plug and play wouldn't just work by itself by magic and like when it's in your net when it's you know in your home network it's because there's no security there's no password no no authentication at all it is authentication free that's what allows all of this just to work automatically. And, of course, we know, we've talked about it before, the Xbox, for example, game console, famously needs UPnP enabled on the router so that it's for, for, for g gaming network knitting themselves together. It needs to open ports through the router to itself so that incoming traffic can get to it. So, and well, and Skype, same thing. Skype, one of Skype's early successes was that it was able to connect to Skype instances behind NAT routers. And there's a bunch of ways, sort of flaky and not really reliable, but they kind of mostly work for, for, for arranging, if you don't have universal plug and play, to connect two endpoints behind routers. But because it doesn't always work, the Skype system also had to have so-called relay nodes, which were outside, where if two endpoints behind routers could not get to each other, then they would re they would relay through this other point. So, and that's why you and I, Leo, have have famously selectively opened some ports that we use with our Skype clients and to give us a non-relay connection because you get a much better Skype result. What happened was. As universal plug and play became more popular, Skype added that technology. So now Skype is a universal plug and play user, and it's able to solve this problem by itself by opening ports and saying, find, and finding out from the router what's my public IP, and then sending that to Skype Central so that somebody who wants to connect to you knows where to send the packets and to which port the router opened for that stuff to come so, in. So that's a so, good thing. I mean, it's a convenience. Massively convenient, but and it even required with some with like gaming boxes like the Xbox. We've talked about this before. I think they invented Microsoft invented this for the Xbox because if you want to do Xbox Live and play games against other people, you need to open those those ports. Yeah, yeah. So, but the key is no authentication. Anybody can access it, and if this stayed constrained to your private network, that would be enough concern. Now, listeners who've been paying attention will know that we have talked, I think it was maybe a couple years ago, that it came to light that some routers had universal plug and play enabled on their public interfaces. And I'm, I remember clearly saying to our listeners, oh my God, make sure that's not you. Go, you know, log into your router, see whether there's a way to disable UPnP on the WAN. The problem is there typically is not because it's not supposed to be on in the first place. It's a, it's a mistake. It's an oversight. So HD Moore, somehow, something, who knows why, what the backstory is, he isn't saying or hasn't said. But starting June 1st of 2012, he launched a project to start scanning the entire public internet the IPv4 address space of 4 billion IPs to start scanning it to just find out what was out there on UPnP. And he was scanning at a speed and with enough servers, I don't know how many or how fast or anything, but he was able to touch every IP on the public internet about weekly. 
This went on for five and a half months from June 1st and concluded around the about around mid-November of of late last year, 2012. He found 81 million universal plug and play exposed routers. Now, the number should be zero, and there's 81 million. So what that says is that 81 million routers will respond to a hacker's universal plug and play query and say, yeah, I'm here. What do you need? Now, how can I help you? <laughs> how can I help you today? What can I do to make your day better? I, I my configuration is your configuration. Oh my God! <laughs> the the response. So this is different from. I just want to make this. I want to understand this. This is different because if you have UPnP turned on in your router, this does not mean you're opening yourself up to the outside world. It means you're opening out yourself to things on inside your network who are reconfiguring your router. So how does it happen Correct. that the router opens UPnP to the outside world? Is this WAN administration? Is this, what is this it, setting? It, 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 there is no, there, there is absolutely, I mean, think about it. Think what this means. This is your router is promiscuously <laughs> responding hey, to un, unsolicited incoming nonsense from the ports? public <laughs> sniff my ports from the public internet and saying hi there um what do you what would you like to change so this is a would flaw you, in the fundamental design of the router yes do we know the manufacturers that do this oh yes okay. all uh 1700 of them <laughs> <laughs> it's a bug is this a bug or is this a feature uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's 1,500 Aww. vendors and 6,900 products. I'm guessing Cisco and Linksys are one. Well, yeah. Gee, Leo, remember, was it last <laughs> week or the week before, we, we, we talked about how many of them hadn't even bothered to fix right. the WPS flaw. Right. Okay. So just I want to sh I'll just share the executive summary from H.D. Moore's paper. Um, I tweeted a bitly, a short bitly link to the PDF. Um, a few hours ago, so it's in my Twitter stream. It's bit.ly slash U-P-N-P-F-L-A-W-S, all lowercase. So it's bit.ly slash U-P-N-P-Flaws. And so his, his executive summary that's not long starts out, Universal Plug and Play is a protocol standard that allows easy communication between computers and network-enabled devices. This protocol is enabled by default on millions of systems, including routers, printers, media servers, IP cameras, smart TVs, oh. home, uh, home automation systems, oh. network storage servers. UPnP support is enabled by default on Microsoft Windows, Mac OS X, and many distributions of Linux. Because, Leo, why wouldn't you want it? But, but, but it's not that an issue if your router doesn't... Support, put this to the outside world. I mean, if you're Correct. yes, if your if your TV, if your smart TV is plugged in directly to your cable modem or your Mac or your PC, well, until in, unless you have both, because then a hacker in Russia can log into your smart TV directly. Right, but if okay. you had a router that didn't do this, you'd be okay, right? Correct, and that okay. that now you understand why top priority for me is adding detection of this to GRC's Shield Up system yeah. so that everyone will be able to immediately determine whether they're exposed. Uh, anyway, so continuing, the UPnP protocol, he says, suffers from a number of basic security problems, many of which have been highlighted over the last 12 years. Authentication is rarely implemented by device manufacturers. I didn't even know there was any. Privileged capabilities are often exposed to untrusted networks, and common programming flaws plague common UPnP software implementations. These issues are endemic across universal plug-and-play enabled applications and network devices. The statistics in this paper were derived from five and a half months of active scanning. UPnP discovery requests were sent to every routable IPv4 address approximately once a week 
from June 1st through November 17th, 2012. This process identified over 81 million unique IP addresses that responded to a standard UPnP discovery request. And remember, that number should be zero. It was 81 million. Further probes determined that approximately 17 million of these systems also exposed the UPnP Simple Object Access Protocol, SOAP, SOAP, service to the world. This level of exposure far exceeded the expectations of the researchers. This paper quantifies the exposure of UPnP enabled systems to the internet at large, classifies these systems by vendor, identifies specific products, and describes a number of new vulnerabilities that were identified in common UPnP implementations. Over 1,500 vendors and 6,900 products were identified that are vulnerable to at least one of the security flaws outlined in this paper. Over 23 million systems were vulnerable to a single remote code execution flaw that was discovered during the course of this research. 23 million remote code execution uh, in their routers. Rapid7 worked with CERT to modify the open source projects and device manufacturers vulnerable to the, and, and notify the open source projects and device manufacturers vulnerable to the issues described in this paper. Unfortunately, the realities of the consumer electronics industry will leave most systems vulnerable for the indefinite future. For this reason, Rapid7 strongly recommends disabling UPnP on all internet-facing systems and replacing systems that do not provide the ability to disable this protocol. Rapid7 has provided a number of tools to help identify UPnP-enabled systems, including the free Scan Now for UPnP, modules for the open source Metasploit framework and updates to the Nexpose vulnerable, uh, vulnerability management platform. So to summarize, 2.2 of the of the total IPv4 address space responds to has exposed universal plug and play services, which is 81 million unique IPs. About 20% of those expose what's called the SOAP API. What happens is when you when you send the UDP packet to the router, the, the so-called discovery packet, it responds with the with a, an identification string telling it what ver version of Linux it's running, what version of which of UPnP library it's running, and it tells you everything you need to know to then send the next exploit packet to it. But it also tells you where it's running its, its HTTP web service because that's the second part of universal plug and play. The first is you use UDP to find the device. Then it tells you which port its little web server is listening on. So isn't that handy? So the, the attacker receives that information and then makes a, a port 80 or actually port whatever. It, it's, it's over the HTTP protocol, but not a port 80. It's, it's most manufacturers uh, have their devices randomly choose a port so that it's not obvious where it's going to be all the time. But all you have to do is ask it. Where is your HTTP service, your UPnP HTTP service? And the router tells you. So then you connect to that. And over a well-understood, well-known API called SOAP, which is sort of an, it's an XML-ish API, you're able to dump out the router's configuration, make whatever changes you like, and send them back. And router will, just as it does if you're an Xbox in the network, or if you're Skype in the network, or if you're BitTorrent in the network, it doesn't care. It makes whatever changes in its configuration has been asked for meaning essentially that it takes the router out of the way for anyone who wants access to your network internally and all the devices on it are then available. So in their analysis, they found that four development kits 
accounted for nearly three quarters, 73 percent of all the discovered universal plug and play instances. So from their scan and the fingerprints that they were able to obtain, mostly from the, the thing just saying, this is what I have, you know, in, in the first response pack, it just lays it all out for you. They determined where the software came from that they were talking to. And there are, unfortunately, this is, hu this is very heterogeneous. I'm sorry, very homogeneous, not very heterogeneous, meaning very few kits have been used across most of these, and they're buggy as hell. So they found that there is one kit called the Mini UPnP, which 332 different products use. 69% um, of those still have version 1.0, which has multiple exploitable flaws. Um, a different library, it, which actually came originally from Intel um, and then became the portable UPnP SDK, um, is now, it, then it went open source, and it's called LibUPnP. 23 million fingerprints out of the 81 million that replied match a version of UPnP that exposes the system to remote code execution. And then get this, Leo, only one UDP packet is all it takes to exploit any of the eight newly discovered live UPnP vulnerabilities, which, as I said, affect 23 million routers out on the Internet. And since it's a single UDP packet, you can spoof the source address. So it's impossible to know where it came from. Wow. It, they, someone drops it on the internet, aims it at you, and it, it executes a vulnerability that exists in your router. So um, 11 years ago, I've seen some people say, hey, Steve, doesn't unplug and pray your free utility from December 28th of 2001, doesn't that fix this? No. What the, the problem was that in classic Microsoft fashion, the whatever it was, it must have been XP, an early version of XP, first offered, whoa, the universal plug and play interface. Isn't this wonderful? We'll be able to configure everything automatically. Um, <laughs> they had a bug in their universal plug and play service, which allowed that computer to be immediately taken over. And at the time, there were no other universal plug-and-play devices anywhere. This was the first instance of universal plug-and-play. There were no TVs. There were no toaster ovens. There were no, you know, bit torrents at the time or, or Skype or anything. Nothing else existed that used it. Yet, Microsoft, forward thinking, had it turned on, even if you didn't need it, and it could be exploited remotely. I, so, I, I'm, I'm really convinced this goes back to Xbox and Xbox Live. That they wanted, you know, an Xbox Live is the ability to play uh, video games against other people on the internet. And yes, of course, can remotely configuring your router right. is an absolute need. I agree. Yeah. Well, it's not a need, but it's certainly, a, you know, most people who buy Xboxes are not going to be sophisticated yeah. enough to do that. And if you do, if you do start your Xbox and you say, I want to, and by the way, this goes back to the original Xbox as well, and you say, I want to play games online. Uh, it will say, oh, you. It says, let me check. Oh, you can't. You've disabled UPnP. Please re-enable, they call it something else, but they say, please <laughs> enable it so that we can configure uh, your router so that we can do it. So, it, I mean, I remember getting calls from you from uh, radio listeners regularly saying, yeah, I'm getting this error message on my Xbox. Yeah. And if you want, if you want to, uh, you know, you can set out uh, outgoing uh, game requests, but you can't accept incoming game requests, obviously. Yep. And there have been articles published where, you know, which show you how to manually configure yeah. a bunch of ports. It's not simple. It's you know, it's not like they were all routers support this. I mean, it's not Yes. It's not impossible. Yes. And so that's what I would end up telling people because I learned from you not to not to say don't turn that on, but here's what uh -huh. you need to do. You need to port forward your router. Yes. It, but so, so blame Microsoft. It's their technology and they actively pushed it. 
on yeah. people. I mean, really actively, yeah. like insisted yeah. on it without any mention of the potential risk. Right. And you can imagine then from the, from the viewpoint of the router vendors, this was a feature that their routers had to offer. Yeah. Because everyone wanted it. Everyone was yeah. demanding it. You know, we need our routers to be auto-config or whatever it is. Who, it was who, probably who what the wants Xbox to make the router it. that doesn't work with Xbox Live? Not you. Yep. Yep. So it really is shameful, really. Yep. So, um, so I looked over the source code, which H.D. Moore has some snippets of in this PDF report. And... The mistakes, the, the, okay, they're not even mistakes. They're not subtle. What <laughs> and the fact that this was it was th th this portable SDK for UPnP devices originally came from Intel. It was a reference it was, library. It's what everybody uses. Yes. Well, it was a reference implementation. Right. And when you look at it, it is so devoid of real world safety checks that. I don't think it was ever intended right. to be used. Right. It's just this and is we, how you would do it were yes. you to implement this on your own device. But of course, we <laughs> removed all of the extra. We made it simple extreme. so you can yes. understand it. Right. And people just used right. it. Exactly. <laughs> I oh, think that's God. how this happened. So it's really it's, twofold. It's the fact that Microsoft had UPnP and encouraged people to use it, and then a bug in the UPnP library. Oh, or not a. Not, several not a. bugs. Oh, my God. That made it possible to do inbound UPnP as well as outbound UPnP. Yes. Well, it yes, it should never be bound. That's the term. You should never have the UPnP service bound to the public interface it was always meant to be on the private interface the the lan inside interface there it makes no sense to have right. it on the wan right yet yet you know who knows people took a, a, an implementation that was never from intel originally that was never meant to actually be used in the real world and because I mean, it, it doesn't have any checks, none, no <laughs> checks for buffer overrun. There, oh, dear. there's a while. No, I mean none. There's oh. a while loop that is scanning for the string you've received, looking for a slash r slash n, a character turn line. It feed. doesn't sanitize the, the inputs at all. No, not at all. <laughs> just send me anything. And so I'll, I'll just look for it. <laughs> so this, and so this while loop doesn't have any other constraints on its oh, yeah. on its execution. So that's not it a looked, that's not a dumb programmer. That was never intended to be in the wild. Correct. The only, when I'm looking at the source code. That's like code, taking example code from a book and putting it in exact, your production product. That's exactly right. And how, you know, we've often seen books that say, here's and you can see that Intel could do this saying, and it was probably in the footnote or in the text, but that they didn't read. They just copied the code where it said, you know, this is a an example of how to use the API. We, we've left out all of the checks and balances that you would normally use in real production code because... That's, you know, as anyone who's done that kind of coding, it, you, you take something simple and it hugely complicates it to check for every possible thing that could right. go wrong. And it so obfuscates instead, it if you're doing an example code. It just gets yes, in the way. You don't want that. Yes, exactly. Because you think, wait a minute, what's this about? It's like, yeah, oh, this yeah. is to check to see if I... check. I don't oh. need that. Yeah. Right. And so, so, so this very simple, I mean, simplistic code is in production. It's in people's routers. Oh, and right. it's bound to the public interface. So, so there are a few libraries, and H.D. Moore and his group looked at them closely, worked with CERT, also CERT KR, that must be Korea, and CERT CN, that must be China, trying to get the word out. Um, the libraries that they have had access to have fixed all the bugs they know of, but this was just a visual inspection. This wasn't like, this is really not their job to fix these libraries, but they when they were looking at the code, they're like, oh my God, how can this be? And so those things have been fixed. And in fact, even the, this, this mini UPnP library had been fixed. I think it was like several of the things they found 
were fixed in 08 and 09, but 69% um, of the current mini UPnP on the net, which was 14% of the total fingerprints collected, were still using 1.0 that had none of these fixes. So, and, and this is the point that he makes in his executive summary at the beginning, is that, you know, we think of these as little plastic boxes. No, you know, I mean, there isn't the same, except for within our own, with our Security Now community, certainly people know about keeping their router firmware up to date and the importance of that. And we don't, we wish that, for example, Cisco had published router firmware to fix the WPS security problem more than a year ago, but no. So there's like, there's, they sell them and they forget them. They don't know who their customers are. And more or less, the customers just think of it as an appliance that they plug in. You know, their Windows box is busy updating itself <laughs> multiple times oh. a day. Chrome's version number has gone into seven digits now. But the, the, the router is sitting there with version 1.0 code that was never meant to be oh. made public that is exposing itself to the Internet. So under mitigation, what do we do about this? The good news is that this all starts with a UDP port 1900 query. That's the port, port 1900 really? of UDP that all these boxes are listening on. That was a sign in the same way that the web uses 80, you know, and pop uses 110 and so forth. UDP port 1900 is universal plug and play. ISPs, we know, are blocking 137 through 139 yeah. and 445. That's net, which are the, that's net BIOS and uh, yes. what's 445? Is that net Same. BIOS also? It's, it's yeah. the newer version of, okay. well, of Microsoft's... Uh, that's file you know, sharing. You don't obviously okay. want to do that over the internet. And that was Precisely. a real big flaw many moons ago. And that's why, that's what induced me to create Shields Up in the first place, right. was that everybody had their C drives right. <laughs> exposed to the internet. <laughs> you go to a hotel so, and you'd see all the, all the hard drives available oh to you. Oh my goodness, yes. So what ISPs could do and must do immediately is block that port. All and there's they no other do, use for that? None. No. So there'd be no side effect? No, no collision. There is no reason for any... ISP subscriber to ever receive incoming traffic on port 1900. None. The router won't won't open it for incoming use because it's already in use by universal plug and play. Right. So it's reserved for that and there is no need for it out on the internet. And in fact, anyone who like is interested if you run a scanner on the net, watch for UDP port 1900. I bet we're going to start seeing this because the other thing that happened is all the hackers know this now, too, right. since yesterday. You know, the Metasploit framework is open source. H.D. Moore <laughs> has published it's every open source. <laughs> yes. Every detail about how to do this, how oh, to take over right. 81 million routers anonymously. And, and he's not doing internet. that maliciously. He's doing that as a, a public In service. full disclosure. Yeah. Yeah. Before he went public, he worked with all the various CERT organizations. They yeah. contacted all the router yeah. vendors. We're promptly ignored. Are, yeah. Um, and, that, and this is just the problem is in the same way that there's still Code Red and NIMDA out there scanning around looking for something vulnerable from, you know, the Flintstones era. Similarly, there are routers that are never going to get fixed. There are There's 81 million of them now. And it's not clear how many of them are going to get fixed. And the other problem is many of these do not have a, an ability. They, they may, in fact, disable universal plug and play on the inside, but leave it enabled on the outside. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's really bad. So, yeah. you, so disabling UPnP isn't going to work on all routers. It's not clear. <laughs> it, it's not clear <laughs> that it shuts down the demon. It may this just. Is, it may this just, is worse than the WPS flaw. Oh, yeah, this, this is, is horrible. Way, this is way worse. Yeah, WPS, you have to be nearby. Right. Here, you Anywhere. know, they, they're, you they're not Russia. going to sleep in China and Russia right now because this is they're going to have too much fun with this. <sighs> Unbelievable. So, so mitigation really has to come from the ISP for most people. You certainly should turn off UPnP in your router, but I do that routinely. 
Yeah, and, and it may again, not be enough. It's why it's why a priority for me is to add detection to yeah. shields up. That's yeah. why you know when I disconnect from you in an hour, in an hour from now, Leo. That's what I'm going to start on. Uh, that's it, easy because you'll just test for port 1900, right? Well, uh, yes. Um, but I'm right now. Shields up is a TCP test. Oh, yeah, it yeah looks, UDP. Uh, yeah. Well, I have all that technology. I've got you know DNS servers and all kinds right, of other stuff. I mean, right. it's not. You know, I mean, it'll take me a couple of days to to nail it down and get it right and do the UI and all that. But I now, will. if I use Shields up right now, it will tell me if port 1900 is open, right? Well, only if TCP 1400. Oh no, I get it. I get it. Open. I get it. I get it. And now, if you knew which, if you knew which TCP port your UDP service was on, then it would tell you that that was open. But you'd have to do a six five five three five port scan. It's on any. It's random. It could, yes, it's random. So that's, you know, crazy. And I'm sure, but I'm going to ask, that DDWRT, Tomato, and the other custom firmwares for routers don't have this problem, I would guess. Um, there are three spreadsheets that I encountered, and I don't know how I found them. I don't think they were links. Maybe they, were, they may have been links in the report, or they may have been on the Rapid7 website. But they do, they have published... Google Doc spreadsheets showing all the router makes and manufacturers. It's like it's like 536 pages long, though. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's a it's a an analysis of what they found and the make and model and version number and so forth of of all the vulnerable routers. Fundamentally, I mean the the only thing the only way to know is to get a test from outside. Now he mentions his in his in the executive summary. There's this scan now thing. Um, I did create a Bitly link for it before I tried it. And then I decided not to share it on oh. Twitter because it's a disaster. Oh. It, it, you know, I mean, the hack hackers write hacking code. Um, they're, they're, it's not production code. It's six megs. Apparently, it requires Java. Mine... I want my when I tried to run it, it scanned a little bit, then just died. Yeah. And you know, who knows why? So maybe it's useful. It's uh bit.ly slash UPnP scan. And that will take you to the page to download Rapid 7's free scanning tool. Uh, uh, it's um and that's a Windows only, by the way. He there there are instructions for how Mac and Linux users could use Metasploit framework. Well, that's the other thing that. you could try to exploit your own network. Well, do yes, pen um, it would be it would be interesting to to find out which devices in your own network are vulnerable. And of course, the problem is we, it, it would be nice if it were cross-platform. Right. Um, and uh, at this point, it isn't. But it's also well, let's just stop well, security now, right now. Go to work. We need this. <laughs> get this thing done. Fix yeah, shields up. We need a UDP night port scan now. Stat pronto. <laughs> you, I know. What, what's, what do you think it'll take you a day or two? Because I um, mean, really, the I clock is ticking on this, right? Um. Oh, you're not even going to be around for your show this weekend. No. Okay. Well. Uh, but I'll we'll make sure if you if you send Chad the information, we'll plug it like crazy. Yeah, uh, I, I I will let I will let you guys know as soon as I have it up. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's and it's we'll tweet only... it, and I'll I I mean I'll I'll be at least on email, so I'll be able to tweet it and everything. Yeah. <sighs> Rapid Seven has a UPnP tester. Do you know what Zen Server says in our chat room? Have you seen that one? That's the one. That's the and one, it's, and it's not good. It's, it's well, you you know, <laughs> use it at your own risk. It didn't. It it it's it's huge and. Awkward. It asks yeah. for your email address, no, so no, they no. want to, you know, upsell you, and it requires Java. Apparently, someone tweeted that he had to install Java in order to run it. I, you know, I've got my Java well under control here. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not a great solution. Well, Steve's will be the best. Um, just get it. Well, and, oh, and that's the other problem is it's it's an internal scanner. What we want is an external scanner, which is what we Shields Up an, is. Your servers probe will our network. Yes, and then I will report do back on what the results of the probe have been. Yep. I'll have it up in a couple days. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Steve. And of course, I'll um, be written an assembler. Yeah. <laughs> Not that it matters because it's server side. So, the, although don't you, you used to? And I think you still do have a download that I can run also, right? There's like a, an additional um, little. 
Uh, there was something I had. I don't even remember the name of it now. I'm trying to remember myself. It was so, some little agent yeah, thing. Yeah, the agent. Uh, yeah. You don't do that yeah. anymore? No. no. I, I, there was just no need, no need for, for it. it. I, right. I, was, I think I did a, a rewrite of the whole technology, and I obsoleted that. Well, and, and what we're trying to do anyway is to see what it looks like from the outside world. That's what you report back. That's so. the whole point, right. yes. Well, you should still disable UPnP on your router if it's enabled. I don't think anybody who listens to this show has it enabled. but Right. I would say if you don't know you need it, disable it, and we'll hope for the best. And <laughs> I, will, I will very soon have a proactive test that anyone can, you know, just go to GRC. I'll, I'll make it easy to find, and it'll just, you know, send that packet to you and let you know if your router responded or not. And, and if it did, that's not good. And to reiterate, does DDWRT or tomato, do you know or do, have you, it's a lot of... I don't, I don't know, but I have to imagine that at least the latest versions of them are fixed. So I would say across the board... Get the latest firmware you can for whatever router you're running. And that's another point that I wanted to make. I'm glad you brought it up again, Leo. Many existing routers who are still using boy, you know, the, the, the standard manufacturer firmware may have this problem. But switching to a, a as you said, Tomato or, or DDWRT firmware, if it's available and compatible with your router hardware... That also solves the problem, right. presumably. And I would guess, but I'm going to have to check this database, that Apple routers are not prone to this. They don't actually have UPnP. They use NAT PMP instead. And remember, it's, 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 not, it's not the UPnP per se that's the problem. It's the external exposure, yes. which is a complete mistake. Right. That makes but in, no in sense. theory, if you didn't have UPnP in your router, whether for whatever reason, it seems unlikely that there, yes. yeah, that there would be an external exposure. Like they would put in a feature that you <laughs> they don't give you access to. So yeah, yeah. okay, wow, this is terrible, terrible, ter <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrifying, and terrible. Yeah, well, I uh, wow. I didn't need anything more to do, but I got to do this. Oh, I'm so sorry. But, I mean, golly, get to work. Oh, it'll be good. It'll be good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Get to work. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, it's, okay, it's so, frustrating to not be able to test for it, right? You don't know. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Continue on. So, uh, I'm just wondering whether the Scan Now utility does allow you to give it a starting and an ending IP... And if you, if you knew a friend's IP, you could run scan now with, with that single IP as the starting and ending IP. And they mentioned in the documentation that that caused it just to scan the one IP. And that would route the packet out through your router across the internet to their router and back. So you could use... In in if you had if you had a, a partner, you could use Scan Now. You mean the Windows built-in Windows tool Scan Now? No, no, no. The no. sorry, no. The this thing they call oh, this, Scan Now. This Rapid the, the Seven rapid, thing. Yeah. Right, the Rapid Seven thing that, that you get at bit.ly slash upnp scan, upnp s c a n. If you set that up outside your network, that is to say, on someone else's network. Right. And knew what your public IP was, you could say, "Okay, John, you know, scan me," and then could that, you, that would, could, I think that that would work. Could you use something like Nmap or tools like that? Nmap's used to do. Oh, you could pen certainly testing. use Metasploit. You could use Metasploit. You could use Metasploit, yeah. Um, if, but the idea is, it's got to be on the outside. So you need some. You I need. You need. I get it. You need a someone, friend to someone do it. Someone else. Yeah. A friend to to you know to send it in your in your direction right. from the outside, and of course Shields Up will do it in a day or two. This is traditional pen testing. This is what people do. Yeah, they look for vulnerabilities, and now there's another yeah. one. Yeah, <laughs> we should offer a service. You know, I'll scan you. <laughs> I'll scan you if you'll scan me. Well, I have that. It's called Shields Up. It just yeah. doesn't do this one yet. Yeah, but it, and again, it we're will... not recommending Rapid Seven. It's not. It crashed on Steve's computer. I'm seeing others in the chat room say it crashed for them. You have to use yeah. Java in the browser it's, to make it work. It's a which piece of junk, actually. Yeah. So we're not saying that's the solution. 
It just seems to be the one available right now. You know what? I'm going to put the chat room to work. Maybe by the end of the show, they'll have another choice. <laughs> okay, so many people asked about, want the full security dump on Mega, you know, Kim.com's yes. new offering. And because of all this, I didn't get to it again. But it will be the topic for next week's Security That's Now fine. podcast. You can do triage. You pick, so, pick the biggest vulnerability first. <laughs> yeah, this was, we have, we're sorting these. And so next week, good. Look forward yes. to it. Yeah. Um, okay, a little miscellaneous kind of fun stuff. I don't know why I got this newsletter. I remember I subscribed to it years ago. In fact, it, the email address it came in on demonstrates how long ago it was. Um, it's the Journal of Physical Security. And it, we have a listener who's at the Argonne National Laboratory or something, because I'm dimly remembering this, but they just the new issue of the Journal of Physical Security came out. And since it's sort of interesting, I just thought I'd give our listeners a heads up. It's jps.anl.gov. So uh, JPS, of course, is Journal of Physical Security. So jps.anl.gov. And of course, ANL is Argonne National Laboratory. And this is just, just to give you a quick little table of contents. Um, they call themselves the first scholarly peer review journal devoted to physical security R&D. The first paper, pages one through nine, is the, Jap the Japan earthquake and the tsunami, their implications for the U.S. Paper number two, lock opening by bumping, physical Ooh. access and secure lock designs, pages 10 through 21. The third paper, how to choose and use seals, uh, as in like, I don't know, King Arthur and a wax or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's pages. So, you know, so how to choose and I use. I want to subscribe to this. This sounds like the best journal ever. Uh, it's wonderful. Yes. Is it email uh, only? Is it a print journal? Uh, just I go want it. There. Yeah, it's neat. So that's pages 22 through 31. <laughs> this is great. And so this is the best magazine I've ever heard of. <laughs> Paper number four is election security. Don't start with fraud investigations. Start with security investigations. Yeah. The fifth one is a viewpoint paper, common election security myths, pages 43 through 45. And then they get this one, page number six or paper number six by D.B. Chang and C.S. Young. Comparison of window stresses from explosions and projectiles. <laughs> this is a government publication. Yeah. From the Argonne National Labs. I mean, this is this is this is not hackers. No. This, this is, is our tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the first scholarly peer-reviewed journal devoted to physical security R and D. I I love this. You could subscribe free of charge. Yeah. Argonne National Laboratory. By the way, just as long as we're, uh, I've interrupted you, uh, somebody in the chat room has come up with this Android program called Port Scanner. lets you scan ports on a remote host via its IP or domain name. Now, but if it's only it, it's TCP. It's got to be UDP, right? So we got to look yep. at this and yep. see. In which case, you just want 1900. So if it did UDP, you would just scan port 1900 UDP. Oh, and the other problem is you, you need to actually send a, a, a deliberately formed oh. discovery packet. It's not just a ping. In, it's, it's Right. Yeah. It's, yes. You have to wake it up and say. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be busy, Leo, for yeah, the next couple of days. Interesting. All right. So this isn't enough. JPS.ANL.gov. I love that. Isn't that wonderful? That's the best magazine I ever heard of. <laughs> they don't come out very often. No, in fact, it would, well, I not got it even my yearly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a long it's, time. It's it's only six volumes in eight years. Yeah, but, but they're still, good. But they're good. They're juicy. Yeah. You can download them as a PDF. Window, I'm sending these to my Kindle right now. <laughs> <laughs> comparison of window stresses from explosions and projectiles. Freaking awesome! Ever wanted to know? And of course, lock, lock bumping is is really interesting. The fact that you know the pins in a lock can can be 
um, can can be caused just by by knocking on the lock. You are able to right. use some some vibrations in order to migrate the pins to their their splice points and then end up being able to turn the tumbler. So. Yeah. This cool apparently stuff. there's a whole team at the Argonne National Laboratory that does this stuff. A bunch of monkeys. Oh. Now that's what tax dollars should go to. <laughs> <laughs> this is wild. Okay. And it's available via PDF for free. Good. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip the the PDK update. We'll do that next week because we're running short of time. Um, I did get a nice tweet from a listener, Dan Fox in Illinois, who has a how-to on running Spinrite in a virtual box ver VM oh, good. on Windows 7, Mac, or Linux. And so we, we talked about where there was a, a listener who, or yeah, a, a, a show listener who talked about booting an external Mac drive, then thus Mac the Mac was running on that drive, not on the Mac's internal drive, and then running Spinrite on a VirtualBox VM in order to run it on the Mac's native drive, which is possible. He referred to a bunch of command line options or, or necessity, and Dan has it all laid out. So it's another bit.ly link that's easy to remember bit.ly slash srvm, as in Spinrite Virtual Machine, srvm. And so it explains how to do that. And he said, P.S. I met Leo in early June of last year after a recording of Twit and showed him a prototype of my master's project called Trust Auth on my MacBook Pro. Yes. I'm, su I'm sure he'll remember it. It's an authentication system using public key crypto instead of passwords for web logins. I didn't understand so, it at all. Another smart listener. But he's smart. And then Michael Vale in Throop, Pennsylvania says, Yes, Virginia. This is very short. Spinrite is for real. I'm a proud owner of Spinrite 6 and finally got to use it. My father-in-law's computer died hard and of course had no backup despite having an irreplaceable photo collection the drive was in such bad shape that it took spinrite almost exactly three weeks but spinrite was able to recover 500 photos including ones of people who had since passed thank you for a great product and for all the sci-fi recommendations i bought all he has in caps of michael mccullum's after reading Euclid's Wall, you and Leo have great taste. And I have to say, Michael McCollum stuff, if you like Euclid's Wall, you're going to love the other stuff. They're, they're great and reasonably priced. So, um, you know what? In, in the interest of time, let's skip, go right to the questions, right? You ready? Yeah. You feel good? Yeah. You, ready? you got your thinking cap on? Listener-driven potpourri number 160, starting with Mike Nash... In Salt Lake City, who asked the question we all ask, am I really secure? Steve, you continue to receive so many questions about SSL sessions, certificates, and concerns over whether the connection is truly secure or not, and whether the hosting network might be intercepting and spoofing the remote host's SSL certificate. Mm. So, what if you were going to create a single web page that users could visit any time they're worried to show whether they're really secure or not? In other words, if you go to GRC and it's maybe an SSL site, and you would say, hey, you should be seeing this. What are you seeing? Is that possible? Could you do it? Thanks for the great information and laughs along the way, Mike. So this is the note that I encountered two weeks ago where I said, oh, oh my God. What a good idea. I can do that. <laughs> Did you do it? And it's what I've been working on ever since. Oh. Um, I brought it online Friday night, and it stayed up for about an hour or two and then died. Um, now the bat, well, and, and unfortunately it took our e-commerce system along with it. Because oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, in the morning, the, on Saturday morning, I got up and it's like, uh oh, what's not working here? Uh, it's, and it's not, it's not Peter Gutman's fault. You remember Peter, we had him on the show yeah. in 2006. Yeah. He's a fantastic uh, security uh, crypto cryptographer, cryptologist, researcher in New Zealand. 
Um, we had him on the show in 06 because he fully examined Windows Vista's DRM content protection yes, model. And he that. wrote this beautiful paper called the, the Longest Suicide Note in History. <laughs> Um, and By so the we way, had Microsoft's still alive, but okay. <laughs> yeah, well, v but Vista didn't last very Vista long, so last. he was, you know, yeah. certainly right about that. Yeah. Anyway, I, I use a library <laughs> called CryptLib, which is Peter's. Uh, it's very nice and very clean, and it turns out that there were some things I didn't understand about the way it was caching sessions because in in doing this test, in fact, Leo, if you can probably grab this uh, PNG if you want to take a look at it. It's okay. Uh, just grc.com slash SSL underscore fingerprints underscore technology dot H -E -N -G. PNG. No, dot PNG. All right. It's a picture I made of the web page when it was working. Yep, there it is. Yeah. It's and uh, much, the most I can blow it up. Oh, oh, so okay. long. I see why it's formatted it. So it's so long. I can zoom in a little bit, but you can't really read it. Wow, this is cool. Anyway, what? So why so did it crash? This, what happened? Oh, it's just it's that um, I, I announced it in into my news group oh, crowd. Oh, told and, people about it. That's yeah, cool. and they all began to play with it. Oh dear. And so it was reissuing sessions for sessions it had already secured. I was trying to obtain the security certificate from them, but. Being smart, Peter reestablishes existing sessions using the standard SSL session resumption technology so he doesn't get a security certificate every time. I didn't understand that. Uh, he and I have a dialogue open now, um, and I had a f so, so, some other questions and confusions. Anyway, what this will do when it's up, it's not up now, um, is it, it's exactly what Mike was asking for. Um, I was hoping that I could make it completely automatic, that you could bring up a web page that would that would get the fingerprint that it has received from the server and compare it to one that it has received from me oh. and, see, and see if they're different. Unfortunately, JavaScript does not have permission right. to, for I, a reason I don't understand because I don't see it being any kind of a security problem. But there is not in the current JavaScript API a means of obtaining security information about the session. Privileged JavaScript running as an applet, for example, in Firefox, can get that. But, you know, that, that, that's an applet, and I didn't want to do an applet. And then it would only be Firefox and not Chrome and IE and Safari and Opera and so forth. So what this does is it, it's still pretty simple. You, where, when, if you're anywhere where you think you may be, someone may be spying on you in your company, in your educational institution, anywhere, you can simply go to this page, it'll be called Fingerprints, and, um, and, and just bring it up. And it will show you a block of the most popular website's fingerprints and also grc.com, where you happen to be. You then check the fingerprint that your browser sees by, you know, right-clicking, um, um, right-clicking on the page and saying, you know, view certificate, and all the certificates show you the fingerprint. What's the, the key of this is it's not possible to forge a fingerprint. That is unforgeable. So an SSL proxy, as we've discussed often, can forge the identity of re a remote site if your computer trusts it. And it would trust it if it has received a, a certificate authority cert from your company, from your university, or whatever. In which case, it can do on-the-fly forgeries. But it's not possible for it to duplicate the, the actual fingerprint of the remote server because the fingerprint is everything. It, it, it for example, includes the, the server's public key. Well... It can't use the same public key because that only matches the private key. And no one knows what the remote server's private key is. So the point is, I will probably next week announce that this system is up and running. And make it's, it'll be the first new service that GRC has offered in a long time. 
uh, or at least I thought it was. Now it looks like we're going to have the UPnP scanner also. Um, but it'll be very cool because it'll allow people to just quickly check to see if anyone might be uh, running a man in the middle attack on them, whether, you know, through, through any form whatsoever. So it'll be very cool. And thank you, Mike, for the idea. I replied to him immediately when I saw his note and thanked him and told him that I was going to get on it and hopefully announce it in two weeks. You well, got too many I, things I, to do now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one's going to wait as well. Question two comes to us from New Jersey. PJ says, in the last couple of Q&A podcasts, the topic of corporate root certificates has come up in relation to a company being able to intercept and view all SSL traffic to its employees. Just what we were talking about in the last question. Yep. Is it true that IE uses the root CA on Windows, but Chrome and Firefox use their own CA or their own list of CAs, I guess? Right. If yes, does that mean if I install a browser after a computer has been issued to me, then my company won't be able to decrypt SSL traffic to this alternate browser? I guess this would only work if the web proxy or gateway does not require the root certificate before allowing you to proceed. It's well, true? it's not quite correct. Um, what, what very likely happens is that when your, your computer is given a essentially a fraudulent certificate authority certificate, it is also given a client certificate. We've not talked about that very much because our typical use of SSL is only to authenticate the remote server. We're anonymous. So we're making an anonymous connection from our end to a non-anonymous authenticated server on the other. But there is in the SSL protocol the provision for the server asking you for a certificate. Well, we don't normally have one. I mean, most of us don't, except that in a corporate setting, the this, this spying SSL proxy, this, this interceptor, it would require a client certificate because it also wants to identify who's making this request. So it's, it's going to lock on to you and, and ask you for a client certificate. So what that means is if you had a computer that came in, you know, you brought your own computer in from the outside and tried to connect it to the corporate network, it would probably fail. It would say, I'm sorry, this computer is not authorized to use our network. What that really, that's code for, we asked for its certificate and it didn't have one. So, you know, go talk to IT. Well, of course, if you talk to IT, they'll give you not only a certificate, but a, f a fraudulent certificate authority that allow, and they'll say, oh, you know, you, now you'll be able to use your computer on our network, which opens it up to spying. So um, that's likely what happens. Now, as for certificate authorities, it is the case that Firefox, from day one, implemented their own, they call it NSS, is the, uh, it might stand for Netscape Security Service or something. Uh, it, that's the library their own SSL library, which which is, has their, it contains all of the Mozilla security infrastructure, and it does have an entire populated uh, certificate authority store. So that's true for Firefox. Obviously, IE is going to use Windows native store, and I and I wasn't sure about Google because from the stories we've talked about in the past, we've heard them being very proactive with certificates, yet when I was doing the work for the fingerprinting system last week, I noticed that the dialogues that came up in Chrome looked like Windows, huh. which led me to believe that Chrome was in fact using Windows security model. So I did some digging and I found Google's, they called the root security policy. And, and they said, Google Chrome attempts to use the root certificate store of the underlying operating system to determine whether an SSL certificate presented by a site is indeed trustworthy with a few exceptions. And then they say, um, in order for Chrome to be able to trust a root certificate, it must either be included by the underlying operating system or explicitly added by users, which of course we're talking about here in the, in the 
inter interception concern. If you are a root CA, the following contacts should be used. And then they list, you know, how to get a hold of Microsoft, Apple, the Linux people, and Android for for if you were a certificate authority who wasn't current, who like, you know, just launching, you would need your root certificate moved into all of these places. So so they're saying don't call us. We're we're using the OS's underlying technology, not our own. So that's the answer. Um, everybody uses the OS's Good. with the single exception of Firefox. And that's probably as it should be. I mean, you don't want I a think whole so bunch too. of search stories. And now they'd be de out of sync and yeah. messed up. And, yeah. And, well, the security issues would be significant as well. Yeah. Um, and we do install, I have installed my own certificate just once, a certificate of authority. And I, what I think was LastPass. I'm trying to remember. I had to run an app for it to authenticate. I'm trying to remember, but it but it came with a little plug-in that you'd run, and and then it would use their own us, which obviously is a scary thing to do. But in this case, yeah, I was just going to say that's yeah. <laughs> but that's I think it was scary. LastPass, but I'm going to have to tr try to remember. Anyway, I don't know why it would have been unless there was a standalone app or something. Yeah, that was... it had to do with using it. I don't use it anymore. I use a Google Authenticator now, but it, remember, you used to have a standalone app that you would run for LastPass to do second factor authentication. Hmm. So you'd give it your password, and then it would say, "Is this a, if this isn't a trusted machine, they would say, all right, now you have to run it, and you can put it on a USB key. But in order for it to be to work, you'd have to install the certificate authority. Um, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't remember that, huh? No. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, don't, I now use a Google Authenticator, although... Probably it's that certificate is still sitting still there. there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was Sesame. Thank you, uh, Serge. Sesame was the name of the, the program, the last pass program you'd run, and it would give yeah. you a, a, a second factor code, but it but it wouldn't work unless you had their certificate on there. Well, okay, it might not have been a certificate authority. It might have might have been, been just a certificate. You're right. A, You're right. Yes. It wasn't a CA. What am I thinking? Of course, yeah. it was just a certificate, which happens yeah. all the time. I install certificates. Whenever I use uh, PGP, you install some exactly, yeah, exactly to yeah. identify your system to it. Right. Yeah. Yep. Toy, stupid of me. Never mind. Forget I said a thing. Back to the questions. Lee in London, in England. Let's skip that one because we're going to have to skip a few. We're running out of time we're here. We, time. we spent we can, lots of time. Yeah, sorry, yeah. and we started late because I had to give a tour. <laughs> My fault. But four is a good one. Yeah, Bill Welker. In Colorado Springs, Colorado. Steve, can you refer me to a source to describe and explain the physical handling of packets in Internet data traffic? I understand the definition of a packet and its contents in terms of the protocol. I cannot comprehend how a packet is physically sent on the wire. Since a wire can only have current on it or not, i.e. as a potential between two endpoints at its voltage, I'm having difficulty understanding how a wire can handle so much data in such a short time and carry that data so that discrete packets are maintained. Am I making sense? I've searched and searched on this. It's amazing how fast electrons are. I've searched and searched on this topic and not found any description of the actual physical handling of a packet on a physical wire. I'm not suggesting it's a topic for security now. I just I want to know if you could refer me to a technical description. I'd be grateful. I just always assumed that the switching, right? It's on and off. It's ones and zeros. Well, um... Yes, um, but one of the cool things, w w one of the cool aspects of the technology, he talks to about how it's able to go so fast right. and how we're able to have the wires draped around the floor and they're running gigabit speeds. <laughs> it's pretty it's like, amazing, that's isn't it? Just crazy, yeah. yes. Um, the we secret, just take it for granted, frankly, because everything oh. else in the computer industry is magic. Yeah, it's like, why not? <laughs> it's okay, all magic. Man. Yeah, it's funny too because that was that I got into a discussion with Jenny of, of about um, Euclid's Wall, where the 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 theme of of the book, as, as we've described, is that a truly massive set of earthquakes shakes civilization to the ground. I mean, just I mean, and regresses us to sort of a pre-technology mode, and and Jenny sort of who's not a technologist said, oh, well, you know, that'll take, what, a week to get back? I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, you know, where do chips come from? Well, you know, the chip place. Yeah, okay. But, <laughs> the chip store. <laughs> but if, if you, the more you think about 
how dependent we are. It's a fine on, thread we hang from. Oh my God, <laughs> on a hierarchy, you know. And, and for example, when I said the same thing to Mark Thompson, he said, "Oh yeah, we'd never recover." You know, it's just yeah. yeah one's like it's so true. One the, electromagnetic the, pulse, one air burst. <laughs> we're gone. You know, that's the one of the I've, I've talked about this before. We were talking about Jerry Purnell and Larry Niven and uh, Lucifer's Hammer is his story of how uh, an asteroid yep. hits Meteor. the Earth, meteorite hits yep. the Earth and sends us back to the Stone Age. But what he says, and I think it's very germane, and uh, is at the early on one of his characters says, you know, we all use this stuff. How many people actually know how it's made, how to make it, how to fix it? Or if we were to lose the technology, how to bring it back? Yes. And that's another I mean, problem. And you, you, we take it for granted, but do we know how to make it? You do. That, Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but how many of the rest of us who use this, we just, you know, thank you, yeah. magic, yeah. magic person. <laughs> it, it, it is phenomenal how much we build on. And I mean, and, and again, there's, there's, you know, I know a lot. I could, you know, start making batteries. But you but couldn't build a cyclotron. No. <laughs> Uh, or even maybe that an would automobile. Be, that'd be rather down, low, low down on my list. Oh, I could build it. <laughs> could you build a car? You could build an oh, internal yeah. combustion engine from scratch. Oh yeah, yeah. Really? Oh yeah. I took mine apart completely on my my fry. I, I, I know how they to, work in principle, but I, the, the thought that I could actually make one that would work. Oh yeah. I mean, it would be stinky and noisy and lot, <laughs> make, you know a lot with a lot of fumes. I'm coming to your you place know, in the uh, case of atomic war then. The EPA would just roll over in their grave. But, but would you know, you know how to refine get... petroleum so that you could they... use it? Ah, uh, that's a problem. See? You're right. <laughs> See? There's there... Yeah. But we you know this is life. We've always been interdependent on one another and it just uh, we forget. Conveniently because if we really thought about it it'd be oh. it'd be terrified. <laughs> you just stay in bed. <laughs> Question 5 from I love well, his not... Twitter hand. Are, are you done? I'm sorry. Go ahead. We, we, we never really answered oh, we didn't Bill's answer question. the question. Yeah, yeah. We just said how bits. Packets, and it's like, okay, how do packets okay, it's get bits. sent? It's bits. It's Go bits. to the next question. On and off, on and off, real fast. Is it really, really switching? It's just, they're speedy little electrons. Is it modulation said, or is it actually uh, on and off? They get up to speed. The, the, cool, the, the concept I wanted to, to actually convey is the notion of differential electricity. That is, it's not one wire, it's two. And that's the key. It's a so-called twisted pair. And people have probably heard the jargon, twisted pair, but it's really crucial. And the reason is that our environment is full of interference, all kinds of noise. And, I mean, electrical noise, radio noise, microwaves in the kitchen. I mean, all just all kinds of interference. How do these wires not pick that up? Well, they actually do. The trick is that... Two wires are intimately, intimately, physically close to each other and tr truly wound around each other so that they pick up the same noise. They both pick up the same thing. So on one end, the, the sender, the transmitter, pulls one wire high and the other one low. And that signal moves through the wire and gets to the other end. Well, any interference which occurs along the way happens to both of them. So the only thing the receiver cares about is the difference in the voltage at the receiving end. It sees one is higher than the other. Doesn't matter how much or, or, or um, it matters in which direction because that's the data. But that it, it doesn't matter whether they're both at 50 volts and amplitude 49 volts. Amplitude doesn't matter, just their relative amplitude. Exactly. The so-called differential. And the, 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 the term for the noise is called common mode. The common mode is that voltage or noise that they share is completely ignored, and it's only the difference. And so the transmitter... It moves the, it, it, when it wants to change it, it, the one that was at a one or a high level, it pulls low and simultaneously pulls the one that was low high. And so out at the other end, they flip positions. And then to that, you add, there, 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 there are many, many protocols that have been developed by clever people over time. The one that was used by the 10 base T, which is the most simple to understand, is, is a, is a technology called Manchester coding. The idea is that you have moments in time which 
can which represent bits of data. And with Manchester code, the the two wires are and so let, let we'll subtract one from the other and call it a one or a zero. So we've 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 dealt with the differential aspect and so what's coming out is a one or a zero. If it's a one for the first half of the bit cell, then we call that a, a one of data. And if it's a one for the second half, we call that a zero of data. Now, the reason that's important, the reason it was not just a one or a zero is say that we wanted to transmit 50 zeros. Well, that would be nothing happening for a long time. Well, is it 50 or 51 or 49? So, the problem is, and we, we've talked about this relative to hard disk drives, they have the same kind of problem called run length limited RLL encoding because as time is passing and nothing happening, you need to know how much nothing happened. And you need to know exactly how much nothing happened. So instead, they use what are called self-clocking codes. Manchester code is one where you always have something happen. It's just when it happens. Does it happen early or does it happen late? If it happens early, it's a one. If it happens late, it's a zero. And that way, independent of the transmitter, the receiver is able to reconstruct the same data that the transmitter sent at the receiving end. And the encoding technologies have gone from that 10 base T simplicity to stuff that I mean just boggles your mind as they go from 10 million bits per second to 10 billion mm. bits per second a mm. thousand times more bits over reliably the reliably yes yes so it it is kind of related to the analog way it was done then yes a it i mean is. analog is modulated right yes and so <clears throat> so here there there's there's no there's no carrier that right. we modulate because that would waste bandwidth. So we're using absolutely all of the wire's oh, cool. ability oh, so cool. to to reflect the change in voltage in time a, as possible. And remember that there is error correction. So, you know, packets have checksums. If something happens that where that doesn't work, we say, ah, send that again. And that, so we do. So all of this stuff is working at some low level of unreliability where it's mostly works. It sounds very much like the way hard drives are th these days. Mostly they work. And if, if they don't, we just ask for it again. And of course, that's actually one of the differences with magnetic storage versus data in transit is data in transit. You can always ask for it again. If it's been written to a hard drive and you can't read it, then there's no one to ask for. You know, whoever wrote it's long gone a week ago. You know, who knows how long ago that got written on the drive. So there's no one to ask. Thus, the reason we actually, we pad the data in a hard drive sector with error correction code so that we can fix it ourselves if we're unable to read it easily. And Leo, with that, we wrap another fabulous podcast. <laughs> we'll save the rest for later. Thank you we for your... Your, uh, I have one question though. I do have a question of my own. Okay, where's your PD? One of your top PDP is gone. Uh, you didn't notice that. Some listener noticed. Oh, that, of right? course, or immediately. The <laughs> chat rooms that's been there's been talking about nothing else for the last hour and a half. Um, Normally, uh, took, for those listening, Steve has three blinking lights behind him that duplicate the face. They're not actual PDP eights, but they they they're replica PDP eights that are actually doing work. And there's normally three of them, and one of them's missing. So what's yes. the story? Um, the guy who did these, um, uh, Bob. He wants it back. He wants, his last name. He, Bob no. called. He wanted his PDP-8 back. Um, he found 30 more of the microprocessor chips. They, they, they were made by Harris. It's a 6120 is the number. It is a PDP-8. And so he's seriously considering bringing this project, the oh, project, good. yes, because this was life. a limited supply, and uh, what, yes, he, he does the silk screen of the face and everything. So he oh, doesn't. And I mean, it's so gorgeous. He doesn't I mean, have the is, original silk screen. He's using yours as a template. Oh no no no! What happened is he loves my frames because oh. I found 
I found this fabulous frame that is a it's a two inch deep frame that all that the whole thing fits behind. And anyway, so oh, aren't I, I lucky to have Steve as a friend? Aren't we all lucky <laughs> that we know a guy like Steve Gibson? Unbelievable. I took it down. I took it down in order to go over to Aaron Brothers Art Mart, where I got the frames. <laughs> get, it, get it made. Yes, and <laughs> uh, what I found on the door was Veggie Grill coming summer of 2013. Oh no! So, oh, hi, Aaron Brothers. Hello, so, Veggie yeah. Grill. We have an yeah. Aaron Brothers up here. Um, and well, and Bob's got one okay. near him. The, it turns out that there's all kinds of serial numbers that I discovered that were stenciled on the back of the frame. Uh, so I'm going to take photos of it. It's the reason it's not already back up there. I'm going to take photos of it, send them to him, and he'll be able to track it down. But And he's not yet sure. He, I'm, I'm sort of pre-announcing something that I shouldn't. You know he can sell every single unit to the Security Now audience. I mean, um, like that. They're just so fat. They're just so fabulous. He's he, For example, he's wondering, should he just do them as as ready to go turnkey finished assembled units he's asked me for permission to embed the code that i wrote my my little utilities the blink and lights program and the little the puzzle uh program that i wrote embed those in the rom so it'll they'll come built in w w uh, with that and of course i said oh absolutely so there may be a project of some short sort for a, that would just use up. He just he's, he feels badly that he's got these thirty beautiful PDP eight mm. chips, and he could turn them into more of those. So and they're just they're just works of art. That's just a beautiful little machine. But on the bright side, you've got a Veggie Brothers store opening near. So. <laughs> <laughs> a Veggie Grill, yeah. Jen, Jenny, who is a vegetarian, loves. She's happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Steve Gibson is at grc.com. That's where you need to go right now. Obviously, there's so many great things, but in a couple well, of days... you will be going there soon. You'll yes. be definitely wanting to go to Shields Up, and we will announce it. I'll tweet it. I'll make sure, you know, Tom Merritt and Father Robert Balliser are hosting Twit on Sunday. Robert, of course, is he's probably in this in the chat room right now. He's our, our enterprise tech guy, and he will absolutely want to talk about this. So just send him a note. You can send, uh, send it to padre at twit.tv if you want, Steve, and... Okay. And include him, and I'll make sure he's up to date on that. And uh, um, we will let you know. And of course, once you're there, you want to buy Shields Up because it's, I mean, uh, Spinrite because that's the world's best hard drive maintenance utility. You might want to check out the amazingly low band rate, bandwidth 16 kilobit version of the show <laughs> that Steve makes available and the transcripts, which are frankly lower bandwidth still at grc.com. Also, uh, that's where future questions can be asked grc.com slash feedback. Um, and uh, someday, perhaps, we'll have your SSL tester there as well. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna suspend it for the uh, for the uh, UDP vulnerability scan and shields up. That's got to take priority. Oh yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. I mean, and I'm at a perfect point right now. I sent email to Peter Gutman this morning asking him how he wanted to proceed on a couple of things that I'd found. Okay. So and he's like in New Zealand, so Lord knows what time it is there. Um, He's just I think it's up, probably right? the middle of the night or something. So yeah. uh, I'm going to – I will immediately add the functionality to GRC. I expect it will take a couple days for me to – mostly just a matter of me coming up to speed on the details of the protocol. All of the infrastructure is in place and bulletproof. And, I mean, this is what it's made for. This is what I right. built GRC originally to do was it was Shields Up. So right. I will we'll have a new service soon. Uh, yeah, well, that's really good news. Thank you for doing yeah. that, Steve. Um, this show is also available uh, on our website. We both uh, make both high-quality audio and video available at twit.tv slash sn. But you can also subscribe wherever podcasts are uh, aggregated, like iTunes and the Zoom Marketplace, places like that. And watch, watch our live if you want. We do the show live every uh, uh, Thursday or Wednesday, I'm sorry, at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC on twit.tv. So tune in next week. We'll be back with more. Security Now. Don't forget our Security Now YouTube channel, another place you can find it at youtube.com slash, I think it's Twit Security Now. No, it's just Security it's Now. It's just it Security works. Now. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. We were able to get most of the uh, shows. Um, if you go to youtube.com slash Twit, you'll get there, and that's got links on the right to all of the, uh, all of the shows. And you'll be tempted by all the other goodies. There's so many good shows now. 25 of them. That's why we basically had to create YouTube channels for individual shows, because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can get 25 show announcements, like four or five a day. That's too much. Thank you, Steve. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Leo. It's a pleasure, and enjoy your red eye to, uh, to the game. Nola. Yay.
Go Niners. Talk to you next week. Security now.